Welcome to Westpac's webinar entitled Riveting Revisions of Medical Package Test Procedures. I'm Alita Brava and I'll be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we start, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can minimize this panel by clicking on the orange arrow button in the upper left corner. You may expand the panel by clicking the same button. Secondly, you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We'll be answering a few questions during the webinar, and if we can't get to all of your questions during the webinar, one of the presenters will follow up with you afterwards. We may also be using the question asking tool during this webinar. Please raise your hand so we can make sure this tool works. Great, thanks. The webinar video and slide deck will be available on Westpac's website within five calendar days. Okay, let's get started. Today's presenters are Herb Schooneman, Katie Tran, and Will Cadet. You may remember Herb from the last webinar on package dynamics. Katie and Will are both lab managers here at Westpac. OK, Herb, take it away. Thanks, Elite. I wanted to welcome everyone to our latest uh, webinar. We call it Riveting Revisions of Medical uh, Package Test Procedures. We, we know that uh, in certain communities, primarily medical devices and pharmaceuticals, have to be very concerned about not only the test standards they use, but maintaining the uh, latest revision of those as well, and that's what we try to do for our clients is to make sure we keep on track of that, uh, keep on top of it, and keep track of it. So today we're going to tell you about uh, some revisions, we call them riveting revisions, of some of those rather uh, common and normally used test procedures. So our agenda will be to, first of all, do a brief review of uh, ISO 11607. This is the document that really governs uh, the uh, package performance and accelerated uh, aging portion of the uh, 510k requirements. Uh, we're going to review um, that document briefly. Again, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, ASTM D3332, which is our conditioning standard and changes to that. We're going to introduce you to, to ASTM F2825, uh, talk about the revisions to our old buddy ASTM D4169, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, another common procedure, ASTM D7386, a more recent procedure, but one designed for that same purpose. So that's our intention today, and to get us started in that process, I'm going to ask uh, Katie Tron to come in here and get us going. Katie, take it away. Thank you, Herb. Hi, my name is Katie, so happy Lunar New Year. The purpose of this webinar, like Herb mentioned, is to educate our customers about the changes of these standards. So let's get started. What is ISO 11607? For people who aren't familiar with ISO 11607, it is a guidance document for validating terminally sterilized medical devices. It is recognized by FDA. You're probably wondering if ISO 11607 is applicable to you. If you have a sterilized medical device which must perform efficiently, safely, and effectively in the hands of the user, then yes, this document is important to you. ISO 11607 is packaging for terminally sterilized medical devices. There are two parts. Part one is the requirement for materials, sterile barrier system, and packaging system. Part two is validation requirement for forming, sealing, and assembly process. If you're wondering which part applies to Westpac, it is part one. We are a testing laboratory that follows that section. Within ISO 11607 part one under Annex B, there is a list of testing categories. They are accelerated aging, conditioning, integrity, internal pressure, performance testing, puncture, seal shrink, and visual inspection. The focus of this webinar is to help about the revision of the two testing standards which falls under the category of conditioning and performance testing. So Will's going to start us off with the conditioning category on the next slide. Thanks, Katie. Hello, my name is Will Cadet, and I will be going over the conditioning category which is listed in ISO 11607 Part 1 Annex B. The first standard we will be talking about is ASTM D4332, which is the standard practice for conditioning container packages or packaging components for testing. At Westpac, we have over 100 chambers capable of meeting the requirements of ASTM D4332. 
there's a photo of three of our large chambers, large enough to comfortably fit six pallets side by side for the temperature and humidity testing. The scope of ASTM D4332 is as follows. It is to simulate the conditions that your package might encounter during its life cycle. As you can see in the photos, your packages could be exposed to different temperature and humidity conditions such as tropical, high moisture environments, freezing conditions, or even hot, dry, and humid conditions. Herb, would you like to elaborate more about temperature and humidity testing? I sure will, uh, Will. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to point out to everyone that the temperature and humidity testing is the most uh, time-consuming, perhaps most uh, extensive or intensive portion of the laboratory validation test procedure. Um, ideally, the temperature and humidity testing would be uh, conducted at the same time as the mechanical portion of the test. That is, you run the uh, impact and the vibration or compression portions at the same time as you're running the temperature and humidity portions. Uh, unfortunately, those conditions are, are pretty difficult to obtain, and these standards then are written uh, for discrete testing. That is, uh, one condition at a time, so that we can clearly control one at a time, and this is fairly normal. It's the normal option for vibration for any of these kind of uh, performance testing. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that. These are actually discrete tests that are run. Uh, Will, back to you. Thank you, Herb. As you can see by the revision history list in this list, it has been around for quite some time. There have been multiple revisions. What I'm here to talk about is the latest revision, which is 2014 at the very top of this list. It was released in January 2015. In case you're wondering why the revision for the standard is not 2015 but 2014, well, it is because the ASM committee worked on it in 2014 but didn't necessarily uh, approve or release it until 2015. And here is a brief overview of all the changes from 2013 to 2014. They've expanded the scope. They've clarified the word equilibrium, and another standard, ASTM F2825, was also introduced. As far as the scope is concerned, this is what the 2013 version looked like. Then in 2014, the following verbiage highlighted in blue was added. They basically added the verbiage saying that the standard is commonly used for conditioning when conducting transit simulation tests. They also include a reference to ASTM D685, which is only relevant when doing box compression strength testing. Another update to the 2014 revision of the standard is the clarification of equilibrium. Essentially, what was added in 2014 was the verbiage in parentheses and highlighted in blue that says equilibrium should, could be shorter or longer than 72 hours. And the final change to ASTM D4332 is the introduction of ASTM F2825. It is the practice for climatic stressing of packaging systems for single parcel delivery. One quick note that this is not currently listed in ISO 11607, well, because the latest version of ISO 11607 was in 2006, and this standard was released at a later date. So now we come to the ASTM F2825. The scope of that particular standard is to evaluate the ability of the package system to withstand ra the range of climatic stresses that may be exposed during distribution throughout the world. Herb, would you like to add something? Thanks, Well, I sure would. Uh, it's important that uh, we all recognize that the conditioning environment for overnight or express delivery of a package system is really no different. Uh, than that for normal parcel. Uh, it goes to the same same error, if you will. The difference comes from the fact that there are typically fewer packages exposed to this environment, uh, which allows for a quicker equilibrium of the uh, hydroscopic materials, and specifically paper, paperboard, corrugated, that kind of stuff, to environments such as high humidity, which uh, affects their strength. So don't think that the this uh, standard uh, is, is saying anything different. It simply is emphasizing the fact that with this type of delivery, you're, you're normally exposed. In other words, a package system is not in a pallet load. It's, it's probably by itself or with a, a bunch of other different size packages, which allows for greater air movement, which allows for 
uh, you know, greater uh, exposure to uh, higher low temperatures and humidity conditions. And, and that's the, the primary reason for the standard. Back to you, Will. Well, thank you, Herb. One thing to keep in mind, if your product needs a refrigerated frozen food storage or cryogenic storage conditions, this standard does not cover it, but it is covered in ASTM D4332. As you can see, the ASTM F2825 is a relatively new standard based on the revision history. It was initially released in 2010 and updated just once since then. At this point, we will answer any questions regarding the material we just presented. Elite, are there any questions for us? Thank you, Elite. Let's get back to the webinar. The second category of ISO 11607 Part 1 Annex B is performance testing. We will talk about ASTM D4169, which is a very well-known standard practice for performance testing of shipping containers and systems. There are three folds shown here. The one on the far left shows the FedEx box placed in its most stable orientation, ready to be dropped. The photo in the middle shows the box being compressed or squeezed to determine how much load it could withstand. The photo on the right shows the box on a vibration table to simulate it being on a truck or air. The scope of ASTM B4169 is to evaluate the ability of the shipping unit or the boxes to withstand the distribution environment. In other words, we bring the distribution environment like the shake, rattle, and roll events that occur during shipment into our testing laboratory. The boxes are tested in a control and repeatable environment. Herb, can you explain the difference between a package performance test and a package integrity test? Well, I think I can handle that one, Katie. Thank you. Um, package performance is a term that's widely used in standards such as D4169. Um, and uh, 7386 that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Uh, we have been asked and, and we've tried to clarify exactly what is a package performance test and what's a package integrity test. And so what we've done is, is to try and say, well, let's see, to avoid some level of confusion in the future, we'll define a package performance test as a quantitative test. In other words, there's numbers involved. You actually are monitoring the product and you're measuring things like transmitted deceleration and vibration response and things like that. So it's a, a quantitative test, numbers involved. And then we've, we've called a package integrity test, such as D4169, uh, which is really a qualitative test. In other words, there's no numbers involved. You simply run the test and then determine uh, whether the package product system survived the test. In other words, it's a go, no-go kind of decision. Okay. And uh, these two test protocols really started in the uh, oh, probably in the 19, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and the, the first one that was really done uh, happened to be a, a standard ASDM D3332. Some are familiar with that for shock, and there's a similar one, D3580 for vibration. And these are, are basically performance test procedures. In other words, there's numbers involved, qualitative. Uh, I'm sorry, quantitative uh, analysis, that kind of thing. Uh, after those were done in the uh, in the 1970s, uh, many people uh, realized that uh, well, we need something now for uh, the other kind of a test where you're not monitoring it. You're trying to actually bring the environment to the laboratory, and that's when work on uh, standards such as uh, ASTM D4169 really began. Uh, that particular standard was about a 10-year plus effort on the part of some very dedicated people to whom we owe, owe a great uh, deal of uh, gratitude. Uh, they spent a lot of time and effort to put these uh, standards together. And uh, basically what they are is a series of procedures that, that uh, essentially allow us to bring the distribution environment or the hazards of the distribution environment into the laboratory and uh, conduct these on package systems in a very controlled and repeatable manner. So it's a the D4169, for example, package integrity test is what we call them, um, is, a, is an example of a, of a industry coming together to really help us define exactly what we're doing in a common format. Um, probably not totally clear, but we'll, we'll work on this a little bit more throughout the webinar. Uh, Katie, back to you. Thank you, Herb. 
So as Herb mentioned, that ACM D469 is a very old timer. It had multiple revisions since 1986. So we are here talking about the latest revision, which was released in 2014, January of this year. So since this standard has been around so long and Herb already provided the insight of it, we'll go more in depth later on of, of this. So let's get started. The previous revision was 2009. There are two changes to the standard. The first change affects the schedule G and H, which in turn affect several distribution cycles. For those who aren't familiar with ACM D4169, there are 18 distribution cycles that you can choose to test your package system. Depending on your package system, which could be a pallet or a package, certain distribution cycle will be appropriate. Within the distribution cycles, there are schedules like the manual handling, the vehicle stacking, and so on. So schedule G is a test input called simulated rail switching. It is used to determine the ability of the shipping unit to withstand acceleration levels and compressive force that might occur during rail switching operation. Some people might think rail switching is switching of the tracks. However, that is in the case. Rail switching is rail car switching. It has nothing to do with switching of the tracks, I want to point out. It has to do with the coupling of different cars within the rail switching yard, where the word switching means changing cars from one train to another. The two standards for rail switching are ASTM D4003, using the test method A, requiring a programmable horizontal impact tester, and ASTM D5277 requires an incline impact tester. The photo on the left shows two different cars coupling within a rail switching yard. The photo on the right is the horizontal impact tester that will simulate such coupling of the cars. We are proud to say we are one of two apps in the USA to have this equipment in use. Herb, would you like to tell us about the rail switching environment? Thanks, Katie. The, uh, the rail switching environment is uh, something that we never experienced because we shouldn't be on a rail car unless we're hobo in the 1930s. Um, but it's a very rich environment in terms of low-level vertical, lateral, and longitudinal vibration and impact. It's kind of rough, actually. Um, the one big exception to this is the rail car coupling environment, uh, which is where the rail cars are assembled in the proper sequence in a rail switching yard, as uh, Katie mentioned. This process is sometimes referred to as rail car humping, uh, because the speed necessary to properly couple the cars was generated by pushing these cars over a small hill, often referred to as a hump. Uh, in a laboratory, this process is duplicated on a programmable horizontal impact test machine uh, that we call a HITS, which is what's shown in the uh, slide that you're looking at now uh, on the right side. Uh, Katie, back to you. Thanks, sir. As I mentioned, the previous revision was 2009. Here's the verbiage in the 2009 revision. Three impacts shall be performed. In the 2004 revision, 14 revision, it shows four impacts. Herb, can you tell us a little bit about draft gear? I sure can, uh, Katie. Um, the, the whole idea of the horizontal impact test sequence is to duplicate this rail car coupling. And there's two different uh, uh, distinct, what, what are referred to as draft gears on the rail car. The standard draft gear um, was designed somewhere in the 1910s time frame, or maybe even actually before that. Uh, but it represents a solid link between the rail cars, as you saw on the previous slide. Okay. There's a uh, another kind of, of uh, draft gear that's called a cushioned undercar draft gear, and that was developed in the 1960s, and it includes a hydraulically damped uh, cylinder between the couple, coupler and the actual rail car. Uh, this system allows for lower acceleration levels. It's kind of like a cushion between those cars, if you will. So you get lower acceleration levels between the uh, hydraulic cylinder and, and the actual car itself. And so that cylinder will compress and spread the shock load over a longer period of time which can occur up to a third of a second, 300 milliseconds uh, or, or less uh, in, in that neighborhood anyway. The, uh, uh, the, the HITS machine, the horizontal impact tester, is specifically designed to duplicate these kinds of, uh, of levels. 
Um, so that's why it's uh, it's important to recognize that there is a difference between those two. Uh, Katie, back to you. Thanks, sir. For the 2009 revision, section 14.3 was very short with one sentence. Allow the carriage to impact a cushion barrier in accordance with the following assurance level. However, in the 2014 revision, this section was expanded into a paragraph. It clarified that assurance level and should be used for open top rail car load tests. Assurance level two is for the box car load test for non-hazardous material, and they eliminate assurance level three. Here's a table listing assurance level one, two, and three in the 2009 revision. In the 2014 revision, the assurance level three was eliminated and the fourth impact was included. I want to point out the levels listed in the table cannot be performed on an incline impact tester. Herb, can you talk about the velocity speed listed in the table? Sure enough, Katie. Uh, the Association of American Railroads, AAR, to those of us in the business, claim that the normal switching of rail cars never exceeds six miles per hour. The reality is that rail car uh, humping or, or coupling speeds at levels of 10 miles per hour or more are relatively common. Uh, also, impacts from a very heavy car, even at six miles per hour, can produce a significant force because, as we all remember, force equals mass times acceleration, according to Newton's second law. So if you happen to have your commodity in a, uh, a car that's already been coupled to a train and uh, the next car uh, down the track, if you will, is, uh, is loaded with uh, cement blocks, even though it's only going at six miles per hour, uh, it can produce a significant uh, impact, a significant force. So uh, it's, it's a probably a good idea to, to make sure that you test at, uh, at the levels shown uh, in the standard or a little higher rather than the ones claimed by the Association of American Railroads. Katie, back to you. Thank you, Herb. So here's a photo of the package system being secured on the horizontal impact tester and ready for testing. Herb, can you tell us the capability of this new equipment? Sure, Katie. This uh, uh, piece of equipment, again, it's called the horizontal impact tester or HITS. Uh, is capable of rail car switching uh, impact levels of uh, 12 miles per hour uh, with either standard draft gear or the uh, cushioned undercarriage uh, draft gear. Back to you, Katie. So you're wondering how the simulated rail switching test inputs conducted. You're in luck. We have a video to show this. Herb, would you explain what's going on in the next few seconds of this video? Thanks, Katie. The test equipment shown here uh, is uh, of a rail car uh, switching impact hits machine capable of 12 miles per hour using either the uh, standard draft gear or the cushioned undercarriage draft gear programmers to achieve the long duration stroke necessary for the uh, uh, cushioned undercarriage rail car impact simulation. Uh, there's a cylinder, a long stroke cylinder that's built into this uh, seismic base. Uh, so let's run that video and you can actually see what it, that looks like in real time. So as you can see, it happens really fast. Uh, that uh, one-third of a second uh, stroke on the programmer goes by real quick. So that's what the uh, rail car simulation laboratory is all about. Katie, back to you. Thanks, Herb. So as you can see, that's pretty much it. It only takes a few seconds to complete one impact. However, the setup takes a decent amount of time because we need to secure the unit on the equipment and watch out for dangerous components that could be flying off the package system during testing. Will will start talking about Schedule H, so take it away, Will. Well, thank you, Katie. The second change to the ASTM D4169 standard is with Schedule H, which is the environmental hazard. The purpose of this test is to provide for anticipated and rapid changes in ambient conditions associated with military distribution of material, as well as to determine the susceptibility of the total pack to the effects of cyclic exposure. There are three assurance levels for this test, but however, the only change was to assurance level one. In 2009, 
the temperature as shown in the box were at minus 10 degrees F and 160 degrees F. In 2014, as you can see in the slide, those values have been adjusted to minus 5 degrees F and 125 degrees F. With these changes to the ASTM D4169, as we have already discussed, the table on the slide shows the distribution cycles that were affected by these updates. Distribution cycles 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 are all affected by Schedule G rail switching. And in general, the majority of the testing we do for our customers are distribution cycles 3 and 13, which you can see were not affected by this update. Also note that distribution cycle two, which is a user-specified environment where you can tailor your testing by choosing different schedules and different orders as you see fit. To that effect, the update schedule H should, al should also be acknowledged in addition to its effect on distribution cycle 18 on the next slide. Here you can see the distribution cycle 18 is utilized for non-commercial government shipments. Herb, would you like to elaborate more on distribution cycle 18? Sure enough, Will. Uh, many portions of the uh, government uh, in the 1980s, except for the military, uh, tried hard to get out of the standards writing business. Uh, that wasn't their core expertise, and they recognized that. So they uh, tried uh, incorporating uh, basically government testing standards into uh, this ASTM D4169, and that's what distribution cycle 18 was all about. Okay. So it was written in an attempt to help consolidate many different government uh, test standards of a non-military nature. So that's why it exists and that's why it has some elements that are somewhat different than what you see in distribution cycles 1 through 17. Okay. Back to you, Will. Thanks again, Herb. And now it's time for another Q&A session. Ali, are there any questions? Thank you, Elite. So going back to the revision of ASTM D4169, in the 2008 revision, another performance standard was introduced. It was the ASTM D7386. Herb, can you give us a brief overview of ASTM D7386? Thanks, Katie. I'll do my best. Uh, as this slide, this slide I'm, I'm sorry, points out, the uh, D7386 standard was a relatively recent in terms of package integrity tests. Again, they call them package performance tests. I refer to them as package integrity. Many of us old timers, I'm speaking of myself, obviously here, uh, often wonder out loud why this procedure was required as a separate document, not simply another distribution cycle. As we'll point out later, what it what it really happened was that this was an attempt to to really uh, modify distribution cycle 13. And, and add some uh, elements to it. And uh, Will, Will and Katie are going to be telling us about that a little bit in the future. But it, it does basically the same thing as uh, 4169, but geared toward the specific requirements of the smaller uh, parcels, such as uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals, probably constitute and, and uh, focus more on the dis distribution environment variability that they might see. So. Katie, can you uh, take it from here? Yes, I can, Herb. So ASTM D7386 is a standard practice for performance testing of packages for single partial delivery system. According to the standard, it is a performance testing, but we define it as integrity testing, as Herb pointed out, because it's a qualitative test rather than a quantitative test. The standard is currently not listed ISO 11607 because the latest revision of ISO 11607 is 2006. The scope of ASTM D7386 is to evaluate the ability of shipping units to withstand the hazard associated with the single partial delivery system environment. So what is a single partial delivery system? The definition of it is not listed in the standard for terminology ASTM D996, but is listed in the standard itself. Single partial delivery system is a distribution courier that transport packages weighing up to 150 pounds through ground, and or air transport systems. ASTM D7386 has only two revision and have been around since 2008. Within ASTM D7386, there are only four test plans, 
these test plans are determined based on the geometry of the package. You cannot select a test plan. So let's go over the flowchart in details. The flowchart will help determine which test plan your package will be conducted. So let's start with the first one. In order for your package to be test plan TS1, it needs to be less than 600 cubic inches, less than 10 pounds, and the longest dimension is less than or equal to 14 inches. This is a small package. If one of the criteria is false, you will go to the test plan TS2. The package needs to have the shortest dimension of less than or equal to 8 inches, and the longest shortest dimension at least four times larger than the shortest dimension and greater than 800 cubic inches. This is a large flat package. If one of the criteria again is false, you will go to test plan TS3 on the next slide. The package needs to have the longest dimension greater than or equal to 36 inches and the other two dimensions are 20 percent or less of the longest dimension. This is a long narrow box. If any other is false, then it will default to test plan TS4, which is for all other packages. Good thing ASTM D7386 has a flowchart to help you determine which test plan to use. It sounds complicated, but it's pretty easy. We use the external dimension of the package to determine the test plan. Due to the package geometry, the two popular test plans our customers use are TS1 and TS4, the small and all other packages. Now that you are familiar with ASTM D7386, it is time to compare ASTM D4169 and D7386, and we'll, we'll go over the details. Well, thanks again, Katie. So anyway, we touched on ASTM D4169 and D7386 for package performance testing. Some of the questions our customers are always asking are what the, are the differences between these two? Or should I use ASTM D4169 or ASTM D7386? So anyway, let's talk about the differences between, between them. On the left side, we can see that the ASTM D4169 was created. There were there was a six-step quantitative testing procedure to optimize protective packaging. A quantitative test meaning that it relied heavily on data collection using instrumentation during shock and vibration testing. This test is applicable for designing cushion systems for things like a server in a package. However, in the medical device field, people aren't so concerned about shock, the level, or shock levels that the product may experience as long as the product still works. They are more worried about ensuring that the product remains sterilized and intact upon use. Therefore, there was a need for a qualitative package integrity test standard. As a result, ASTM D4169 was developed to bring the distribution environment into the lab. In most recent years, the industry needed a test standard for shipping packages overnight or two days because products needed to arrive sooner. As a result, ASTM D7386 was born and it focuses on the medical and the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industries and is quite similar to the ISTA 3A. Other differences between ASTM D4169 and D7386 are listed in this slide. ASTM D4169 has had 20 plus revisions, 18 distribution cycles, and is also listed in ISO 11607, whereas D7386 has only had two revisions thus far, only includes four test schedules and is not listed in ISO 11607. Herb, would you care to add anything else? Thanks, Will. Uh, I'd like uh, everyone to note that the D4169 protocol has been around for a long time. It's uh, suffered through many revisions, as we've shown you. While the D7386 standard is less than eight years old, but in reality, it's been around a long time because it's, uh, as I pointed out earlier, uh, in the elaboration of uh, D4169 distribution cycle 13. So in essence, it's been around for a long time as well. Uh, the uh, ASTM uh, D10 committee simply thought it wise to create a separate standard for this particular thing. So uh, they're, they're, these two standards are a whole lot more similar than what you might think just by looking at the fact that they are uh, different standards uh, entirely. Uh, Will, back to you. Thanks, Herb. Uh, furthermore, 
as far as ASTM D4169 is concerned, it has a broader scope that, scope that includes packages, pallets, and crates. ASTM D7386 has a narrow scope and includes single parcel shipment packages, which are generally speaking small, flat, or narrow boxes. As we mentioned, ASTM D7386 was in, in, introduced in 2008 revision of D4169 and is listed under distribution cycle 13 where it says to consider the use of ASTM D7386, as you can see in the slide. Because of that, we'll further compare ASTM D4169 distribution cycle 13 and ASTM D7386 on the next slide. Here's a listing of the individual test inputs for ASTM D4169 distribution cycle 13 on the left and the test schedules one through four of D7386 on the right. They both have some form of drops like manual handling. They have altitude testing, vibration, and also concentrated impacts. Herb, would you like to add more to this? The uh, uh, concentrated impacts are, are kind of a new thing for uh, a lot of standards. You'll find it uh, in a few places. And uh, it was inserted into this particular procedure as a method of identifying what happens when the package drops onto uh, a pointed surface, uh, a corner uh, of a, an existing package on the ground already, or what happens if a, a package gets dropped on top of another package with a corner down impact. So this concentrated impact uh, it was something that was kind of long overdue. The committee struggled with, uh, with that concept for quite a while, and the uh, so-called concentrated impact was a compromise uh, version of what might constitute a good test for uh, these so-called pointed uh, impacts in the uh, in the distribution environment. Also, as Will pointed out, there's a vibration with top load added to the 7386 standard, uh, kind of a recognition that uh, you don't just have a box on a on a truck or aircraft bouncing down the road. What you have is is a consolidated group of, uh, of, of, of uh, products and container systems that are together being subjected to vibration. So this vibration with top load is an attempt to kind of duplicate, if possible, that particular environment as best we can. Uh, Will, back to you. Thanks, Herb. So other differences also in includes uh, drop heights, orientations, and vibration spectra, in addition to everything that we just mentioned earlier. So. You might be wondering, which standard should I use? With the variety of test standards available, like ASTM D432 or F2825 or even 4169, or even the ISDA series, what have you, the first thing you should do is con continue to use the test methods that you have been providing you valuable data. In other words, there are, if, you're, if there are no field failures, then why switch stand standards? Herb, can you give us any more thought about the FDA? Sure, Will. Uh, my suspicion only, but if I had to guess, I guess the FDA really doesn't know or care what constitutes a good laboratory simulation of the distribution environment for medical devices or pharmaceuticals. They're not into transportation. They certainly like the idea of a consensus standard, whether or not it constitutes a better overall test. They like the idea of a consensus standard. Okay. They certainly um, uh, that are adamant uh, about uh, the fact that the test engineer do their homework uh, about the procedures that best fit a given anticipated distribution environment and that the whole process be very well thought out uh, and well documented. So um, as Will pointed out, probably the biggest question there or the question we're asked most uh, is what standard should I use? Is this one better than that one, et cetera, et cetera. And the real answer is that while only one of them, D4169, is recognized in, in the uh, 11607 ISO standard, the reality is that, that the latest revision came out in 2006 before 7386 uh, was in the ASTM books. And uh, we've also been informed unofficially that the ISTA procedures have received uh, FDA approval as well. So the, the reality is whatever procedure that you choose to use and is well documented will likely be accepted by the, the FDA. I can't speak for them, but uh, none of our clients have ever told us that they uh, couldn't use a particular standard if it was well documented. 
So that's about the best answer we can give. And, and it's basically, it doesn't matter what the exact designation is as long as you do your homework and justify what you're doing. Okay, back to you, Will. So in conclusion, we talked about the new updates to ASTM D4332 and ASTM D4169 and their impact to testing procedures for which, for the most part, does not affect the majority of our customer base. We also talked about ASTM F2825 and 7386 and their applicability. We hope we were able to provide you with some insights as well as some history, and thank you, Herb, for that. And hope you have a great day. At this point, Herb, is there anything else you'd like to add? Thanks, Will. Kind of as a concluding remark, I'd like to also remind people that uh, uh, the oldest standard is not necessarily the best. Uh, we, we should point that out. The, uh, the oldest standards uh, for package integrity testing, I'll, I'll use that term, um, is actually the ISTA procedures. They weren't called it then. They were called NSTA and some other things even before that. Um, so they're, they're actually the oldest standard. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, they, they, they work quite well. All these standards are amazingly similar when you, when you really take them apart and look at the elements of them. Uh, when you think about it, they're, what they're trying to do is simulate the distribution environment, which is fairly well uh, defined now. It contains elements such as impacts and vibration and temperature and humidity, that kind of stuff. So all these standards, and by these I mean ISTA, ASTM D4169, and then the, uh, the D4386 uh, with the uh, others as well that we mentioned, the, the, the uh, uh, environmental uh, temperature and humidity standards, they all are aimed at the same goal, namely uh, duplicating what the real environment is. And the real environment's been the real environment for a long time. You know, temperature and humidity have been around for a long time, so has impacts, gravity has been around a long time. So don't think that the newest standard is necessarily the best uh, in that regard. Sometimes it is because people have done a, perhaps a better job of, uh, of defining that environment. But for the most part, uh, it hasn't changed very much over the years. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, any test protocol that you can justify uh, as an endorsement to the uh, FDA uh, will likely pass muster as long as you've done your homework and say this is what I think the environment is based on my study and uh, uh, based on, uh, on what the actual standard calls for. So uh, again, it's, it's kind of a non-answer of which procedure should I use, but the, the real answer is that you can use any of them as long as you do your homework and justify it. Okay, so let's uh, find out if there's any uh, additional uh, questions. Uh, Elite, uh, what can you tell us about uh, questions that our audience might have. 